Um, just so you know, we are recording this webinar as well. So in case you miss any any parts of the webinar um, or you want to repeat any sections of it, then we will be sending that round on a YouTube video link later. Um, we also have a, a YouTube um, site with all the previous webinars and some other video content on there. So um, we'll send that link through too and please feel free to, to browse that and view any of the previous webinars that we've done. Okay, so a bit about Central Technology First. For those of you who don't know, we're established in 2002. We're a managed IT services provider and we own and run our own UK uh, data center infrastructure, um, which runs all of our cloud connectivity and telecom services. My name is Richard Thompson. I'm the sales director at CT. And today I'm going to talk to you about GDPR, NIS, um, improving your IT security, Veeam backup, and disaster recovery as well. So um, GDPR first on the highlights. Um, regulation, so it does have a direct effect and it comes into effect on the 25th of May 2018. The government is committed, the UK government is committed to GDPR. So even if there are some changes after Brexit or uh, whatever happens with the, with the EU after Brexit, then um, the UK government have confirmed that they are committed to proceeding with the, the GDPR. Um, and GDPR really is, is about three things, which is people, process, and technology. So the people need to be aware of what GDPR is in the business. You need to have the right processes in place and also the right technology in place that helps protect your, your network and your data. So there are 12 steps which organizations can take to prepare for GDPR. Um, these are the steps that the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, have put together, um, which includes awareness, so understanding what the GDPR is in terms of um, what the policy includes uh, and what you need to be aware of as a user when you're handling data. The information that you hold, uh, communicating privacy information, individuals' rights, so what rights do they have in terms of that data being stored and access to that data. Subject access requests, legal basis for processing personal data, consent, children, in terms of children's data that you've got stored and processing, data breaches, data protection by design, data protection officer, and international as well. So there are a number of areas which the ICO have identified in which you can help take um, steps. I've talked um, a lot more detail about these steps in the previous webinar. So if you do want to, to know a bit more about that, then either you can visit the ICO website or visit our previous uh, webinar, which is on our YouTube channel. So what is GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation? Um, the ITO, the Information Commission's Office, um, state that if you have been managing data protection, you will see many principles for GDPR are the same as those within the Data Protection Act, which the Data Protection Act we've been talking about for a long time. Um, GDPR does include an important step change in data protection, um, and that's because it's, it revolves um, and includes the regulation now as well, um, ensuring that businesses are having to become compliant with that data, data protection. So why is technology important within GDPR? Um, well, it's often where the data is stored. Many businesses don't run on paper now, so using computers, so either they're processing that data or storing that data on their network. Um, and there needs to be considerations around where that data is at rest and in transit. So where it's stored and, and where you're sending it to and from. Um, and that can include all the applications that you've currently got in your business. And if you think about those, there's all the, the smaller applications as well. So things that you might use to share that data um, or send that data to other, to other individuals in the business or outside of the business. Um, and it's about processing um, and automation of data as well. So if, for example, you are storing data um, in, a, in a third party tool, which might be 
um, a marketing tool with you, with some of your customer data in there. How is that being stored? How is it being processed? Um, is it being backed up at, you know in another country? Um, so it's, it's all about where the data is and, and how it's being being processed. So I want to talk a little bit as well today about NIS, uh, which is the Network Information Security Directive. Um, and this, this directive comes into effect at the same time in May 2018. Um, and there's been some talk about NIS uh, within the news and the media about the potential fines relating back similar to GDPR. It is separate to GDPR, but it is coming into effect in, 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 at the same time. And essentially, it's the first piece of EU legislation that's been made around cybersecurity, um, ensuring that businesses are operating to cybersecurity standards. The difference with the NIS is that um, it only applies to operators of essential services and digital service providers. Essential services have been um, have been classed as things like banking, water, utility, um, and then digital service providers, people like cloud providers, search engines. Um, so the NIS directive won't affect all businesses within the UK and the EU, um, although the directive is being incorporated and rolled out into the UK as well. Um, so the, the key the key point on this is that you you need to really look at, at the GDPR, um, which is which is what the UK is confirmed will be taking into effect, uh, and look about how your data can be managed um, and, and stored and processed in the correct way. So let's talk a little bit about improving IT security, um, and then I'll summarise at the end on the GDPR, NIS, and IT security as a whole as well. First of all, web filtering. Um, I put this put this slide on first and wanted to talk about this first because it's a service that's not always that's not often been implemented in businesses, and that's because initially web filtering was very much seen as a content control um, service and application. It was often seen as being put into the organisation so that you could control the content of what your your users on the network see and also control when they access the internet and what parts of the internet. So for example, they can only get on Facebook at lunchtime or something. However, web filtering has and, and can play a really big part in, in security um, because you've seen obviously all the phishing emails that come through with um, you know, UPS delivery and you could potentially click on the link. Now, whilst you have email security software to try and filter the majority of that out, um, you, the companies and the organizations that are, that are targeting this spam are very clever and getting more effective and and while the email security is forever trying to block that spam and um, those organizations are forever trying to get through it so it's always a battle and there'll always be some that do get through and those that get through you're then relying on the user to understand and interpret how that might be a um, a phishing email and, and, and malware and not a um, you know not a genuine email and so by having web filtering in place that means that if that email does come through and your end user does click on it um, then the web filtering software will recognize that it's not a valid address and if it's trying to download something um, that's that, that could potentially harm the network so it would block that web traffic um, and it blocks it before it installs it so it's an extra layer um, of protection to the network and it's a really important part just as important as antiviruses and an email filtering is web filtering plays plays an important part in ensuring the network secure um, and it also controls network and, and bandwidth management as well so in terms of you know when people can access and, and what they can access um, but but for us I think the data security element is, is the largest aspect and the reason why you would want to to have web filtering software. Uh, the product that we have that does that is CT Protect, um, which will send details through afterwards. And um, the second thing I want to talk about was data encryption. So as you can appreciate, part of GDPR is ensuring 
um, that, you, that your data is, is protected. And if you have personal data that's stored uh, or personal data that's relative to customers that's stored on a, on a laptop and the laptop gets lost and it's not encrypted, then potentially that data could be accessed. So encryption is, is really important. Um, and ESET is, is a product that we recommend that can do that. And that offers full disk encryption, as well as being able to encrypt your removable media, USB pens and, and emails as well. Um, ESET Desklock also has a centralized management tool. So you can see which devices you've got encrypted. Um, and you can also remotely wipe those devices if they get lost or stolen. Email filtering. Um, important to have a good email filtering tool in place. We recommend William Penguin, um, as well as being able to filter out the, the spam that you receive. Um, again, it's controlling network and bandwidth management, so it's pushing away all that, that bad traffic rather than filtering it at your end uh, on the network. It filters it within our infrastructure. Um, and also, if, you're, if you have a, an on-site email server and that, that isn't accessible, then you can access your emails through Roaring Penguin as well. So it provides you with email continuity if your email system is not available. And also that does email encryption as well. An enterprise class backup system is, is very important. Um, what we class as a, an enterprise class backup system would include a number of factors which we've put on this slide here. Um, so firstly, an image level backup. What we mean by image level is it takes a snapshot image of the server or device that it's backing up. So rather than just backing up parts of it, like the documents, files, folders, it backs up the whole image, including the operating system, how it's configured, desktop, image, everything. Um, and, and the great thing about that is that when it comes around to restoring that backup, uh, we restore it as an image and it's there exactly as it was. So it needs to be image level. Um, and we operate to a 3 to one backup strategy, which is um, three cop at least three copies of the data on two different types of media with one off-site. So that's at least three copies of the data on two different types of media with one off-site. Uh, and by using that strategy ensures that you, your backup um, is, is in multiple locations and, and that it's safe. And a retention is important on backup as well. Um, <clears throat> so grandfather, father, son, the GFS is a, uh, a traditional retention policy that's been used for quite some time, just ensuring that you've got you know, for example, a monthly, a weekly, and a daily backup. Um, but you need to think about the retention policy that's specific to your business and your organization. So if, for example, somebody does delete a file and you only notice a couple of weeks later, how important would that be? You know, how, how, many, how far do you want to go back and how many retentions of the backup do you need? Um, and that can be configured within the software that you have so that you can decide on those, that, those retentions. So it's important to be aware of that. So if you don't know um, your, your current retention policy on your backup, um, then I would ask you to speak with your IT provider or if you're with Central Technology, then to speak with your account manager um, just to ascertain what your current retention policy is and how far your backup does go. It's important to have the correct hardware in place as well for the backup. So um, at the bottom there, I've put the backup as a service, um, which is a service we provide by putting in a small, it's like a small server really, with a lot of storage. And that sits in next to your server infrastructure, backs up your servers, but then also allows you to run one of the servers if there's, for some reason, the hardware fails or there's an issue with the servers. Um, and it also allows the restoration of the backup to be completed much quicker. So having the correct hardware in place does help the backup as well. And auditing and reporting um, clearly is really important because if you don't know the backup is, is running correctly, um, then, then there's, there's, you know, there's, there's no point having the backup. Um, so ensuring that it's monitored and ensuring that we've got a report coming out to say that the backup's been completed successfully. And if not, why not? I mean, that's important as well to have within the software. 
So the software that we use for the Enterprise Class Backup System is Veeam. Um, so first of all, who are Veeam? Veeam is a software company providing backup software. Um, and they've got over 2,000 employees, over $600 million of revenue worldwide. So it's a, it's a huge IT software organization. And they're the, um, they're, the, they're the leader in backing up virtual machines, uh, virtual machines within VMware and Hyper-V. Um, you can't buy direct from Veeam. Um, Veeam work through partners such as Central Technology. And through Central Technology, you can also have what we call Veeam Cloud Connect, which is a, a product of Veeam that allows you to uh, back up your servers to the cloud infrastructure. Um, so just to run through that again, Veeam is a software company. They use a piece of software called Veeam Backup and Replication, which is, which is the software that we recommend to use. And you can back up uh, your servers both on-premise and in the cloud using the Veeam Cloud Connect product. So the Veeam Cloud Connect product in our very simple diagram here, um, it backs up your server virtual machines. So that's, that's your servers that are on-premise and puts them into our data center infrastructure. Um, by doing that, you're, um, you're then ensuring that you've got an off-site backup. That off-site backup is automated and you can rest assured that your backup is encrypted and also is uh, rested within the, the UK as well. All our, all our backup infrastructure, indeed all our infrastructure, is, uh, is owned and managed by us and is in with it within the UK. Veeam also does uh, disaster recovery as a service. Um, so this, um, this diagram illustrates here, we can see the customer on the left-hand side with all their servers. Um, and then on, shown on number two, we can see that it's, it's, that data is then replicated. So that would be across to central technology infrastructure, for example, in the cloud. We can see in option three that we've got some servers there. So what Disaster Recovery as a Service does is it goes one step further than a backup. So rather than having the image level backup that's available for you to, to download or restore from in the cloud, it allows you to run that server in the cloud. So if your server goes down on site, you can go into your Veeam portal online using a, using a web browser on your phone, and you can turn your servers on on the cloud via the web browser. So if you do have an infrastructure failure on site, or you can't get to site, or there's an issue with connectivity, then you can at least access your servers via the cloud um, through disaster recovery as a service. And then um, hence number four ensures that the service continues running uh, with, with little interruption to, to end users or your customers. So just to summarize that, um, together Veeam and Central Technology can firstly back up and protect your data with Veeam Cloud Connect, and secondly improve disaster recovery and continuity with uh, Veeam's disaster recovery as a service. So to summarize all those points about the, the IT security as well, um, antivirus and anti-malware protection is important. A correctly configured firewall, web filtering, which we talked about on the first slide, email filtering, up-to-date operating system, so nobody running Windows XP, enterprise class backup system, such as the Veeam that we just talked about, and data encryption, which is the ESET Deslock product. So I just want to run through some of these, um, some of the key takeaways from today, and also talk a little bit about GDPR again. So to summarise, um, GDPR is about about the protection of personal data, and it's about ensuring that you've got uh, and understood the policies that are in place uh, for your data. So it's about the awareness of, of your data, you know, where, where is it stored, where is it held, how is it backed up, who has access to it, how is it processed, and documenting that. Um, and then it's about ensuring that data is, is protected, which obviously technologies can help do that because often the data is stored on technology, um, which is why the two are very much interlinked. 
NIS is only applicable to the service operators that we talked about and also digital service providers. Um, and, and therefore, the next step really in terms of looking at GDPR as a whole um, would be to either have some GDPR consultation, um, which, which we do through a partner, which may include things like a data mapping exercise, so looking at where the data is stored and analysing that, or doing things like data protection audits. And the second thing you can do is a data security audit, um, which we do in terms of looking at the network, seeing how the data flows in and out of the business, where people are accessing that data, how are they accessing that data, and ways that uh, technology can help improve the protection of the data, the cyber security within, within your network. Okay, so um, it's time for any questions and answers. Um, there is a chat box up in the, if you hover up in the top, um, little little um, bubble there, and you can click on and type any questions that you've got at all. Okay, I had one question come in just on um, the GDPR, the uh, the ICO on the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, yes, it is. Um, it's 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 a free service. It's a government-run service. Um, and if you Google the ICO, you can go to their website. And there's also actually a helpline on there as well. Um, so um, if you did want to ask specifically whether um, you need to be protected on certain areas, then you can get in touch with the ICO and ask them directly. Um, alternatively, for a bit more information about some areas of the GDPR, I did talk about them previously in, on the last webinar, which is available on our YouTube channel. Another question here on Veeam, um, just on the components for the disaster recovery. So the disaster recovery of the service needs a number of elements to it. Um, first of all, there's, there's your servers. Um, and they need we, need, we need to put in place the Veeam backup software. So that would include a piece of software called Veeam backup and replication. So firstly, you would need to, to either buy the software or you can pay for it monthly. Um, and then second of all, um, you would need a, the product, which would be the Veeam DR product, um, which is a, a monthly license. And that allows you to back up your virtual machine. And then thirdly, you need to store your data um, within the cloud as well. Um, so they're, they're, the, they're the kind of the components to disaster recovery as a service. And if you want any more information, we've also got the data sheets on that. Um, so do feel free to, to email me at the end of the webinar if you need further information on that. Okay, so um, our next webinar date is in October. Um, do contact me or your account manager if you want to arrange a technology security audit or consultation with GDPR, or if you need any more information or details on the products and services that we've talked about today. So thank you very much for listening, and um, we look forward to seeing you in October. Bye-bye.